You should see it change over there. Yep. See that okay? Yep. Good. Very good. So I see we got quite a few joined here. Thanks everybody for, uh, for register and signing on here. Um, real excited about what we got planned today. Um, this is actually our 11th uh, Sodic and Friends webinar series um, on 11 11 at one o'clock in case anybody's counting. But um, <laughs> Yeah, real excited to have Donna and, and Brent here from Isometric Micro Molding. I wanted to give a, a quick shout out before we get started. Uh, Len Hampton, you should see on the top of your screen there. He's a Sodic National Sales Manager. He sort of sponsored uh, this whole, you know, Sodic and Friends webinar series. Um, myself, my name is Bennett. I'm sales for Sodic. I cover uh, Minnesota, including Isometric, uh, these folks, and, and a couple other areas for us. And then... Uh, We've got uh, Weston Harbaugh will be kind of our host for today. If you've joined a, a past webinar, you, you know Weston. Um, he's our uh, sales engineer for the East Coast and then a portion of the Midwest as well. So again, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to Donna Biber and Brent Hahn here from Isometric. A uh, couple announcements and then we'll, uh, we'll get going here. So again, this is our 11th webinar here. We've got... Uh, some really good ones coming up. Next week, we've got uh, Sodic OPM Metal 3D Printer. So we're going to have uh, Masa Fukushima from the Sodic Metal side presenting on the, uh, the OPM Metal 3D Printer. Really cool technology, um, if you've seen that. So real excited about that as well. Then I think a couple weeks later, we've got Sumitomo Chemical going to be uh, presenting. I believe it's Epson Edo is going to be presenting on their LCP on different applications for that material, um, followed by Kistler, who I know a lot of folks know, and then a liquid silicone based uh, presentation uh, from Extreme Molding. Uh, so that brings us kind of through January. So we're excited about those as well. But um, yeah, so to get us started here again, we've got Donna Biber and Brent Hahn from Isometric Micro Molding. These guys have been a great partner of Sodix for, I think since, early 2000s, talking with, with Donna yesterday. But, um, you know, these guys are an absolute leader in the micro molding world. Uh, if you know that world, you've, you've heard of them. And and uh, certainly Donna, if, if you've been to a lot of these shows, you've probably seen uh, her present as well on some of this stuff. So um, really excited to see this today. These are folks that are really uh, testing the limits of, of what can be done in the injection molding space. So, um, so very excited to have you guys here. So I think with that, um, I will hand it over to Weston maybe to talk through uh, question and answer and, and how we'll handle that and we'll get started. Thanks. All right, thanks, Bennett. A um, Couple quick things here before we hand it off to Donna. First, we're gonna do some of our, you know, 35, 45 minutes worth of presentation, then we'll have a question and answer session after that. Um, to submit the question, let's use the Q&A portion or the chat portion in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, send those all into the host, and as they come in, I will uh, read them off to Donna and let Donna address them at the end, or, or Brant as well, uh, whoever. So, um, outside of that is, Appreciate the introduction, Bennett and um, and Len for uh, hosting these for for Sodic, and yes, we'll let you take take the part, Donna. Go ahead. All right. Oh, good expression. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you here today, and thank you, Sodic, for putting on this event and and so many others uh, that are so helpful for educating ourselves during COVID. So it's a great opportunity. Appreciate it. So my name is Donna Bibber. I'm Vice President of Business Development for Isometric Micromolding. A little bit of background on me. Um, I am a plastics engineer from University of Massachusetts Lowell. So uh, you'll recognize my accent here. Um, I've been in the industry for 33 years. Gosh, I hate when I can say that, but uh, 33 passionate years on really most of it being in the micro uh, micro molding uh, started out in Corning Life Sciences, uh, 
and I was 10 years there and uh, that's where I got the bug really for micro. So I'm really excited to uh, make this kind of educational and uh, favorite part of my job is to is to see and unfortunately I can't in this one to see innovation happen when people get excited about, oh, I can see something that's similar to what I need and then extrapolating and, and creating new and innovative devices. So really appreciate this opportunity and uh, I also want to uh, introduce my colleague uh, Brent Hahn. He's also uh, in sales. Uh, he's our global sales director and he's he and I have been on the uh, kind of speaking front for many years, uh, mostly as competitors and, and just this year became uh, colleagues uh, working both from isometric micromolding. He's going to be in the Q&A section a little bit later as well. So, so um, our agenda here is uh, just an introduction, a little bit about isometric, and then we'll dive right into case studies. These are three separate case studies. Uh, the first one is thin-walled cannulas and sheaths. Uh, and the second one is the use of CT scanning in a micro-molding design of experiment. And number three is the use of micro 3D printing in micro-molding. And we'll conclude, and uh, as Bennett said, and we'll, we'll get into the, the Q&A section here. So leave enough time for that. So a little bit about isometric. Uh, we started in 1990. Uh, as many molders did, uh, we started out as a mold maker, uh, really high, high precision tooling for um, medical OEMs in the Twin Cities area. We're located about 45 minutes east of the Twin Cities area. And uh, so we sold tooling and still do nationwide for a specific group of, of uh, OEMs. And in uh, 2008, those same OEMs that were molding inside said, great, thank you very much for these tiny little parts. Uh, now we want to put them together with other tiny parts. And so in 2008, we started uh, building full uh, microassembly automation systems, which I'll show you a couple of photos of here. And then 2013, we purchased the building across the street and I moved from Massachusetts to Wisconsin and really started um, building the micro molding side of the business. And that was where we got our first SODIC. Um, I've, I've been in previous companies that have, have also purchased SODIC since, since 2000, but um, Isometric has had them since 2014. That same year we brought on CT scanning because we found that to be extremely beneficial to developing our processes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, just this year, we also added 3D microprinting, so incredible technology that can kind of mimic what we're going to do with the micro molding before we actually build the mold. So we can flush out a lot of um, a lot of designs uh, very quickly there. So it's been fantastic to have that. And then uh, we're about to get our first two shot micro molding machine. Sorry, guys, it's not SODIC, but um, we're, we're, we're dabbling into that right now. And uh, it's actually being installed this week. Uh, looking forward to um, really uh, learning how to use that equipment in, in the next six months or so before we uh, say that we we have that capability. We're ultra conservative that way. About 85 employees, 42 mole makers on staff, which is a large amount of mole makers, um, and you'll see why. Uh, seven of those are mole designers. Um, so uh, ISO 1345. Uh, obviously, we do a lot of medical and drug delivery device, uh, which is the topic here today. Last seven clean rooms and about 33,000 square feet. So, kind of all this technology, where are we going with all this, all these capabilities? And they roll all up to providing micro components and assemblies that uh, save and improve lives. What a, what a great uh, uh, position to be in. Uh, very exciting to be able to do that and humbling. So, a little bit of definition. Most, most have seen these definitions over the years, and, and I think most micro molders define it the same way. Because um, there's really no standard definition in the industry, but um, it's fractions of a plastic pellet, fractions of a gram, wall thicknesses of say 100 micron to 300 micron or 5,000 to 15 ish, and um, have micron tolerance, so single micron tolerances, some crazy length to thickness ratio, length to diameter ratio, but it's also microscopic features on larger parts. So. You might look at this part over here um, as well the size of a quarter and it doesn't really look micro like well that's that's not micro molding but if you look closely there is a um, channel in here that starts from 250 microns in depth that goes all the way down to 
near nothingness, three microns is where it ends up. And that, that whole channel is very critical all the way through that channel, even up to and including the three microns. So the core, the steel core that made that um, micromolded part possible is micro. And the inspection of metrology to measure and make sure that we got that three micron channel to 1.33 CPK is also micro. So beginning kind of an end, not so much um, in the middle, it's a, it's a larger part, so it wouldn't be considered truly micro. So we use the 60 ton SODIC for that, and uh, it's fantastic. So as you know, SODIC uh, is, a, is a really elite micro molding machine, and uh, we've been very happy with, uh, with them. So you can see the stretch from, you know, fractions of a plastic pellet. Our smallest is a thousand parts per plastic pellet and 0 0.00004 grams. So that, that's obviously micro, but this is not. So in between, we have some small parts that are high precision, um, and then there's, you know, true micro. So the benefits to having all those core competencies that I already talked about, the 3D microprinting, the tooling, the molding, automation, and CT scanning is really just to keep the datum structure all the way through from tooling through to, uh, to through to metrology. We want to make sure that when we're programming that datum structure of the mold, it's the same as we're using in metrology. And as it sounds like a simple point, but it's really to the nth degree that we kind of control that datum structure all the way through. And we're looking for a single microns in each of these uh, sections, which I'll talk about a little bit. So benefits are obvious cost, cost containment uh, for uh, making sure that we can make parts as, as quickly as we can and kind of, again, flush out those design criteria. Um, we can do the small and micro uh, and larger parts assembly. So we make the small one and bring the larger ones together with the smaller, which gives the opportunity for a single supply chain, which is an advantage of cost. Uh, we have a extreme, we call it the PFMEA on steroids because that's just what it is, is really getting to the nitty gritty with the process map. And I'm gonna dive into that with, with some of our um, case studies here. So we have, having that firsthand knowledge all the way through this process is extremely critical. So we don't have to have one outsourced and then bring it in and trying to figure that out and how it fits with the rest of the, the puzzle pieces, so to speak. So quality, obviously, again, keeping that datum structure intact and single micron tolerances is, is gonna give the best quality component and the highest resolution in feature replication. Um, it's also uh, verifying design intent with uh, CT scanning. That's, that's been fantastic. And we'll show some uh, really good examples of that. And therefore, there's no gaps in design history. So we have all these things in-house. You don't have to worry about the tool coming in as a gap. Um, and then the maintaining of that tooling is also a gap for longevity of the, of the run. So and we have uh, subject matter experts in each of these capabilities in-house that help our customers kind of transition from one uh, section of the, of the process to the next. And, um, and then timeline, speed through development and controlling the timelines. It's always something that our medical and drug delivery device customers want to make sure that they're, they're first to market and controlling those timelines. So I'm going to dive right in here with case study number one. And this application is many different sizes and um, wall thicknesses and materials of these, but basically it's a, this one is an FEP, so a fluoropolymer needle sheath for an insulin pump. So our problem statement here is you can't tell if this part that's a half half an inch long and three thousandths um, wall thickness with, an, with a hollow ID. So this is tubular here. And so can you fill something this long and thin? And that's the problem statement. And also, you know, these are, you know, as you can imagine, the insulin pump, they're very high volume. So the other problem statement is, Great, you can make one in a row, but can we look at DFM and DFA, uh, design for manufacturability and automation and scalability, make sure that the first one we make is also scalable to tens of millions and sometimes hundreds of millions. So the critical product attributes here is just really important to know right from the get-go so we can plan for success here is um, 25 to 50 micron or 
one thou to two thou lumen chamfer. So right on the end, most of these have some level of chamfer here because that's going into the skin and the needle goes through the center. So the needle does the puncturing and then the, the sheath or the cannula kind of goes along for the ride. And we want to make sure that we're not pulling skin or tissue with that. That's why that's so important. It's called compliance, which is two things. One, the least pain to the patient, and two, um, that it's an easy to use device. So those two things are just definitely critical attributes. Um, the other one is how long this is, a half inch long. We can't make a half a part there. We have to make it long enough so that it's um, so that it stays in place and uh, and also attaches to other parts in the assembly. Uh, the wall thickness extremely small, uh, three thousandths wall thickness over a half half inch long. Um, and if most most mole flow analysis will say that's not possible, um, but I'll show you how how we've done that in this example as well. And then the ID in this case is eight thousand, so two hundred micron, and it's it's those can also vary. They could be twelve thousand, they could be fourteen thousand, they could be eight. So this example is eight. So it's a pretty high aspect ratio. Usually, with most um, uh, replicating. Uh, um, methods of manufacturing, you would be stoked to get a one to one aspect ratio. But we're really hitting it with 166 to one, which is unusual. But um, you'll see as we kind of peel this back how we are able to make such high aspect ratio parts. So the actual grade of this is a Key Moore's 9494 FEP, thankfully, a 30 gram per 10 minute melt flow rate. So that, that definitely helped us here. And uh, there's many similar applications, as I said, in the sheath and the needles that are in polyolefins or nylon or nylon copolymers. So here's the actual part next to a key here, just to give you a sense of scale as well. You know, you know, it's this half an, half an inch, but very, very tiny part. So getting into our kind of PFMEA and process map on steroids, this is so key to all of the case studies that I'm going to show you here today. And that is called uh, our microns matter. We, we trademark this because it's so, we, we believe in this so much uh, and really breaking down our process to um, be realistic with what we're gonna find in each of these, each of these process variables. So for example, this is an example and it's a general, it's kind of generally what we see. This, um, this one is plus or minus eight micron tolerance. And, and still with those single micron tolerance, we still need to be 1.33 CPK. Uh, and so we're gonna break that down and we're first gonna be looking at the tooling. And the tooling, we need to hit that tooling to 20% of tolerance to give us the rest of that 80% to, to take up in the rest of the process. Meaning gauge r, &R is uh, industry standard is 20% or less. The molding process, 20%, again, this is general. Material drying, 10%, material lot to lot variation, 10%, sometimes more. So I'm just gonna give you a general example here. And then other, you know, can take up 10 or 20%. And so we really break this down for these eight micron tolerances because we're really looking for a micron pretty much in each of these categories. So we start with tooling and then we'll look at, um, again, 20% of tolerance, but specifically gating, what style gate, what size, what vestige, then the longevity of that gate. Is it going to stay, uh, you know, is, or the tooling? Is it, are they going to stay for the full depreciation value of the tool? Do we need spares? Do we need core pin recognition so that, um, you know, these hair size core pins aren't getting uh, damaged during, during molding? And then the maintenance being such an important factor. So we're going to look at these literally with a fine tooth comb and a process map to make sure that we're covering all the risks. We do this at quote, which sounds a little crazy, but even at quote, you wanna make sure that you've covered most of those risks within the, within the quote before it's quoted. So those can be explained because you never have really apples to apples in terms of quotes. So what are you truly getting and, and how in depth has, has your supplier gone to, to make sure that this is, uh, this is looked at properly before we, before we quote. Um, then we're going to look at material. And material, that's uh, in this example, 20% on, on average. We want, in generally speaking, a melt flow rate because they're long and thin. There's really thin walls. We want a good melt flow rate. 
higher than 10 grams per 10 minutes. Now, have we done sm smaller than that? Yes, but generally speaking, we'd like to see, um, you know, a, a decent um, viscosity to, to fill these long and thin things. And we have material lot to lot variation. Sounds like a, a no brainer to get two to three manufacturing lots, not just generally lots, but they've actually been extruded in three, two to three different manufacturing lots. Really tough to get as a micromolder <laughs> because the parts are small. You need a bag or, you know, three bags to, to validate, maybe 10 bags uh, or a Gaylord. But how do you get two to three manufacturing lots? You know to get your validation correct and so it's it's sometimes difficult to get that uh, but so critical because we want to really see what what that melt flow rate uh, you know range does if you're over here or on the low side so very important to um, to get that covered in, in the risk assessment then we have material drying that's that can be really really important for uh, hydroscopic materials so, um, and then empirical data, which I'll show you how we get not just theoretical, but empirical data in terms of shrink, flow, and physical property testing that helps us with our uh, PFMEA. And then in the micromolding process, we're using primarily sodic presses. Uh, we do scientific molding here. We've got uh, many um, uh, RJG trained uh, employees, master molders, um, injection pressures, around 40,000 PSI, sometimes 50,000 PSI, and the injection time is 0.01 seconds. So it's, it is, it's right in there, and that's why the tooling is so important, and why you know we have 42 mole makers on staff, and that is the enabler to doing anything that we're gonna show you here today. Not to mention that the, the SODIC is important as well, but if you have your tool um, correct, you're really 80% of the way there, and I'm sure Sodic would agree to that as well. Um, and then we have a Priamis uh, process control with the, with the in-mold temperature and pressure sensors. Kind of difficult to get a lot of points at 0.01 seconds, but even two is better than zero. So um, that's been somewhat helpful to us, um, but we're we're still developing that. And then the gauge r, &R. we thankfully have the CT scanning, and that really reduces our gauge iron error from 20%, which is industry standard to 10. And then uh, having, we learned this the hard way, so here's a, here's a nice tip for you. Uh, and when you're talking about micron tolerances, make sure that your, uh, your lab is both humidity and temperature control, because um, when we had a CT scan, I'll talk about how we did this, we literally breathed on the part and CT scanned it, and it came out a different reading because the material was hygroscopic. So it was sucking in the moisture from that breath. So it's, it's crazy, but it's it's absolutely, when you're looking at single micron tolerances, these are things that have to be absolutely controlled to the to the end. So let's look at some gating styles for that um, cannula. We looked at a, a whole bunch of different ones and then we, the next slide is talking about um, how we did some mole flow analysis and how we down selected. So some of these might be obvious, but you can look at this and go, gosh, you know, how are we gonna degate this thing? Um, this is an edge gate and it's almost all the way down the part. And of course this is going in the skin so we can't have any gate vestige later. So this one was quickly ruled out. Um, we, we understood from the uh, this application that it was only needed to go into the skin a certain amount. So this became a possibility. Okay, we're gonna, gonna edge gate it, but then we still have that secondary op, which is not ideal. And this one was double double gated, and we just did that for giggles just to see what the injection pressure would be, if it would be that much different than these. Um, the ones, the two that we ended up going with um, are the, the ring gate here, which um, you can see is kind of attached to the top of the flange here. And then also the double tunnel. We love this. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of parts that we do are double tunnel gated like this because they help us with the flow that keeping that balanced flow down this down this core pin uh, by having the two gates and also splitting the risk with respect to injection pressure. We have one, and then it also knits around the other side, and then has the tendency to not fill consistently as well. So both of these were, were trialed in this case. So mole flow analysis. 
So a general rule of thumb is this has really been a guideline more than a rule. It's not the greatest predictor of flow because as you as you can see here, barely, there's um, the mesh of the mole flow analysis. These little tiny nodes, triangular nodes, um, have to be so um, condensed like pixels in a, in a camera, they have to be so crowded to know what's going on in a 4,000th gate or 2,000th wall. You really need to really get a lot of those in there. And then in order to do that, your mesh and your CAD needs to be very large. And so it's, you know, it's hard to handle those big files. And so you can get there, it's just not ideal. So we end up not really meshing it the right way and getting a quick answer. So it's it's getting there. There's, there's more and more, um, work being done on that, but we generally use this as a guide. And so, for example, this part that we've already done many, many of these parts that are round like this. And so we know from experience that this is already going to fill, but MoFlow only predicted it's going to fill three quarters of the way. So we might look at that and go, ah, three quarters of the way. We know from experience and the melt flow rate and other factors like the tool that this will fill. And so what it is good for, however, is let's just say we want to try a larger gate diameter or we want to move the gate. It's a good comparison from here's our baseline to what are we changing next? So I wouldn't say that we would just rule this out and never use it. It is used um, when we try to do this for risk mitigation just to see how far we can go. But it's again, not going to give you the final answer as a predictor of flow. We also have to extrapolate. Sometimes there's no material that the actual material we want is not in the database. So we have to extrapolate to the closest material. Um, and I'll show you some other considerations that we use that are far better predictors for us and more useful in empirical data. Um, and then we have to consider the shear rate considerations because these gates, um, you remember this was, this was a 3,000th wall thickness and it goes all the way up. So you can't have a huge gate because it's gonna pluck. So our gate ended up being six thou, which is crazy because usually you don't have a larger gate than you do of the part. Generally speaking, you want 75% of the wall thickness as your gate size. But thankfully in micro, we can kind of break those rules a little bit. So, but imagine the material going through that, that very small six thousandths hole, it's going to shear. And then that shear, actually it's instantaneous shear too. It's not. It's not very long, it's 0.01 seconds. So that instantaneous shear though kind of helps us to fill these long and thin type parts. So um, those are things that we have to consider though for each material, How, you know, are they shear sensitive? Uh, like bioresorbs, uh, you know, those are very shear sensitive. We probably wouldn't be able to get away with that, that small of a gate. And so the end results here of these ring gates, um, you can see this one does require uh, a secondary operation. So we had to remove this from the ring gate, but luckily the top portion of this, why we went with this is it's not that critical at the very top. So this would be cut off, you know, very accurately in automation through, um, through, through a, a knife type operation, slicing type of operation, or um, a laser operation could also do it. So it ended up being a uh, nice fill, filled nicely in the, um, in the mole flow analysis and also, uh, as you can see, in the parts. And again, our preferred gate, we never have to touch this again, which is fantastic. Now we can just go right into automation or right to the package um, and not have to worry about a secondary operation. Anytime you have a secondary operation or you let the part go and pick it back up, we have the opportunity for increased bio burden. So we want to decrease that as much as we can by handling it just once if it's possible. So next we get to tooling and the, the kind of myth, I guess, in, in the industry is, oh, I can just use my regular tooling sources for this. And as I said, I, I moved out here specifically because the tooling is so critical. I can't stress that enough that it's you really have to get this right or you're, you're kind of in trouble um, initially and uh, for, for the life of tool. So, um, so the tooling is the enabler to um, these, these FEP cannula parts. And again, looking at mold design and how robust that core pin is, 
is that core pin held in the um, in the A side as well as the B, so that we don't have that thing flailing around in the breeze? Do we have enough vents down below to make sure that's the last place to fill? So we want to get the gases out there. Um, also, um, as you can see by this uh, depiction over here on the right, you want to make sure that the core and cavity are, are registered correctly and, and have um, have uh, no offsets with respect to core and X, Y, and Z, so that you would have a thicker side on one side and thinner on the other side, because what will happen is it will flow down the thick and leave that thin side short. We want a nice balanced flow, so we're not one flow front and head of the other, and then we tweak or break the core pen. So it was very, very important to get extreme accuracy uh, core to cavity registration. And the equipment that we use, we have some amazing equipment. This one is 0 0.0001 millimeters scale, and it is um, five axis mill. So we're able to mill uh, solids. We're also able to do some, uh, this is a sodic, oh, it's a sodic a, a micro sinker EDM. We have also have the sodic micro wire EDM, which the smallest wire is seven tenths of a thousandth of an inch or 16 microns. So when you get down to those levels of wire or end mills that are four tenths of a thousandth of an inch and it's double fluted, the, the end mills that's double fluted, you get really good at one thousandths or two thousandths, 25 to 50 micron uh, end mills. So always pushing that envelope to see how far we can go, learn what we need to learn, and then pull that back so that we're in a general range that we see a lot more applications. So um, again, I can't stress enough um, about the, the venting too, and that's so critical. We usually make it without venting first, and see what we get and then add the vents because sometimes just the natural core and cavity venting is sufficient. We don't need to add any more. Um, so yeah, we like to check that out first before we add them because it's, it's hard to go backwards. Um, again, so tolerance to single micron. So we're going to build our tooling to 20% of this. Uh, cores as small as three microns. Generally speaking, our cores are above 100 microns, but we, as you could see, we've done some down to the three micron range. Ejector pins, things that push off of uh, very small features can be as small as uh, 3,000 or 70, 75 microns, that should be 75. Um, and again, I think what's really important about this risk mitigation and PFMEA on steroids is to all the way through look at the mold maintenance and the parting line. You know, you've got these little picks coming off of the gates sometime and those collecting on the parting line when you have core pins that are, you know, three quarters of a hair size, it doesn't take much to tweak that over. So special care on parting line is really important. It's very different um, in terms of the care to the parting line than conventional and macro molding. And then we um, have 42 mole makers on staff, so what's what's unique about having that ability inside is you're maintaining the tools for life of program with the mold masters that made the mold to begin with. So that's also a pretty really critical factor to consider in a PFMEA. And so getting into the micro molding equipment, uh, you, you see a soda here. This is a 60 ton press. We have some 30 tons in the background there. Um, what's unique about the SODIC, and I remember even in the year 2000, looking at the first SODIC, um, when the literature came out and said uh, one micron positional accuracy. And, you know, as an engineer, you always have to be proven. It's like, oh, one micron, come on, really? You get to one micron positional accuracy of injection. And sure enough, um, we were able to test that, you know, you, you still do it today, test a, you know, full injection, back it off a little, you get a tiny little U, little short shot. Put it one micron, one micron positional accuracy. You can see the difference between a short shot and, and, a, and a full part. So fantastic equipment, uh, really have it uh, good control. So we have both horizontal and vertical, but this uh, case study, of course, used a vertical, excuse me, horizontal. Um, some of the screws and plungers, um, as you might know, the 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 SODIC has a screw over plunger. The plunger actually does the dosing into the mold, the final dose. And uh, 
shot sizes ranging from four grams to 14 grams in house here and uh, 20 ton to 60 ton with uh, the 60 ton has the 14 gram shot size. So some other auxiliary equipment that kind of goes along with that also part of the PFMEA is can you dry it? Can you moisture analyze to confirm that you dried it correctly? And within the dryer, as small as it is, what's going on at the top of the dryer to the middle of the dryer to the bottom of the dryer? What's going on inside the screw? Do you still have the moisture content that you need in the parts? Grind those up, test it, see what you have. So all the way through the process, you can, like a PFME on steroids, really determine what's going on all the way through because it does affect the viscosity of the material. It does affect the uh, quality of the component and, and what control you have over the process. So very, very important to get the, the proper drying there. Uh, nitrogen fed hoppers, it helps us to Again, keep keep control of that, and also control of um, black specs. Um, you know, for those for those uh, transparent uh, uh, materials such as polycarbonate, cyclic olefin, um, PMMA, and so on, and static eliminators. I, I've I've been on this on the been talking about micromolding for a lot of years. Let's just say, and uh, one one story I just can't get out of my head with the static is. Um, you know, somebody molding the parts and, you know, we didn't have a hair net on at the time and it was kind of the parts are collecting in like a tube and then all of a sudden the person that was standing next to the tube, all the parts just went right into the person's hair because of static, like the whole day's production just went. Whoosh. And so that day was the day I learned the, the value of <laughs> static eliminators and we have them everywhere. Our our flooring is anti-static flooring. Our paint on the wall, anti-static paint. We went crazy with the, with the static, but for obvious reasons, some of these parts are very tiny and need point of use static eliminators. So that's also needed. Now, general rules of thumb here. Again, we're working to in micro molding forty thousand to fifty thousand psi of injection, sometimes higher, at 0.01 seconds. Uh, that's it. We we don't get any um, longer times to do that. We yeah, we really have to get it right. Um, generally speaking, too, we don't want that general rule of thumb of four to five times per square inch in terms of the surface area on the mold. It's 10 times. Because we're going at it at that 40,000 PSI of injection pressure, we kind of have to tweak that general rule of thumb to 10 times um, the t for the tonnage to, to determine what the tonnage is. We also don't run run less than 20% of the tonnage of the machine because we don't get that control that we need of, of the party line and making sure that we have that, that closed. That's a general rule of thumb. Uh, I'm sure there are some, some places that could break that, but that's our general rule of thumb. And then using a shot size that registers, believe it or not, more than one quarter of a revolution of the screw. And sometimes that's all we get because of the size of the part. There, there are a thousand parts per plastic pellet, so we have to add material to, it's, a, it's a, at the thousand parts per plastic pellet, that thing would stay in there and bake without any runner. So we have to add material to actually register uh, some revolution of that screw to get some control. Um, material wise, um, general rule of thumb for material, um, uh, melt flow rate again, uh, making sure that we have some good melt flow, have two to three lots, um, I already talked about some of this. We'll go to the next one, which is um, this is our empirical data to really look at uh, PFMEA 1,000 stick, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand stick samples because this is a mold that we made ourselves and designed for um, this PFMEA. You can see this tiny little pin gate right here is six thou to thirteen thou. So um, this particular one was uh, six thou pin gate, and we were able to make sure that we could flow a 3000 sample. Before we started to make this mold, we put this material in to determine even with the simple shape, we can fill this. We also, it's about the size of the letter I on your keyboard, just to give you a sense of scale. We also have an edge gate uh, version of this as well, because sometimes we don't have the real estate for a pin gate, we prefer the pin, so there's no secondary out. So we have these um, outputs of actual shrink, the gate style effectiveness to fill, the gate vestige, we get to determine, hey, what do we have for vestige even with this simple shape? Uh, and then again, the physical, physical properties were shearing this material. Did we 
do anything to those physical properties, at least tensile properties we can tell in this case, um, before we um, flush out as much as we can before we build a mold. Case study number two, um, and I know I'm uh, got only about five minutes. I think this will the third one goes pretty quickly. So the benefits to CT scanning and using it as a method of design of experiment. So if you're not familiar with CT scan, this is the CT scan over here with an X-ray, and then the X-ray source has the parts in in a uh, styrofoam, and the styrofoam um, gets X-rayed, but it's not seen by the X-ray because it's only going to see the densest part, which is the actual parts themselves, which is fantastic because now we get no fixture error. It negated that fixture. So we're only going to take that part now as a point cloud and lay it over the perfect solid model and get these color deviation. Uh, fantastic way to get um, a retain, because uh, that retain is always saved as an STL file. It never has a shelf life. You can pull it up from the year 2014 and plop it over the year 2020. And now we can see what we get from the difference. Um, so something validated and just revalidate again, that everything is still uh, the same as it was. So fantastic. I, I won't go through all these benefits, but um, very, very um, beneficial. So problem statement here is this part right here is, uh, you can see eight thousandths wall. It's 600 thousandths long and 275 wide. So we didn't know if this was going to fill. There might be some short shots, the product quality, cavity, cavity variation. Somebody had, had failed at this before. So we wanted to make sure that we, uh, for this intraocular component, that we have this all covered. It's a 50 to 1 aspect ratio, poly cell phone, so high heat, difficult material. And oh, by the way, it was ended up being a hot runner. So how we use this um, to our advantage is on DOEs. And so we're out at the sodic press here, it's 30 ton. And we're developing our DOE. So we might be doing injection pressures, speeds, highs, lows, temperatures, highs, lows. And we're trying to dial in. We're trying to dial this in. And the, the old way is to, here's a traditional fair down here. I know it's pretty small, but we're looking at a bunch of numbers on a page after, and this can be like two weeks later that we measure this. And so we kind of lost our train of thought if we don't get this kind of immediately as we're doing our DOE. So what we do is we pass these through from the clean room into the into the CT scan. And in 15 minutes, we have a full first article that has been previously programmed. And so now we get this view, which is a full first article on this part. And now we can go, wait a minute, we just had three criticals out of the 14. We need to not go that high with the injection pressure. Let's bring that down. So we're really, really trying to not get so tight of a window. We wanna give ourselves a healthy window and still get that 1.33 CPK. So it's fantastic use of the CT scan here. The other use is you get to see inside the part. You get to see, you can see the gate here. You can see if there's a bubble or an inclusion or there's something inside the part that's called the raw image that you can see. Also can see um, if there's assembly bond problems from one side to the other. So that's, that's fantastic. So the other use is getting all 16 cavities here. So you can see this, and this, uh, this is going to keep rolling here. Uh, this is cavity two, and that's what cavity two looks like. You know, cavity three, what cavity three looks like. And so now we're able to look at every single cavity combination and what it looks like. And every person in the organization can look at this and understand what's right or wrong with a part. You don't really need to have uh, a metrology degree to to understand what you're seeing. So it's good for all diverse um, across all diverse backgrounds. Now this one you can see there's a short shot. That's not that's something we're trying to mitigate. So it it, it point that out and you can see the tolerance scale. Um, this is in millimeters um, that the purple is not desirable, obviously. So I should have said at the beginning, but the red and the purple are not desirable. That's going to help us um, really dial in these, a slight short shot there, um, really dial in our process for a 16 cavity tool. And now we can put all 16 of these over one another and determine what we have by each cavity to cavity. And so that helps us to go, wait a minute, look at cavity 11's got this weird thing going on and we probably should take a look at cavity 11 before we put this through automation because it's gonna wreak some havoc later on and be very costly later on. 
So extremely helpful to a tool to do that. And lastly, um, this is our third uh, case study is using 3D microprinting and micromolding. So we have uh, the ability is like seven different photopolymers that we use for uh, this this uh, micro 3D printing. It's not it's thermal set versus thermal plastic. So thermal sets cannot be melted to other thermal sets. They have to be glued. So that's the one um, one downfall here. But what it is really good at is to replicate. Um, even the thinnest wall. We've made um, two two thousandths wall. This is a hollow tube component, and this has this right here is eight thou. These little fins, and you can see that the uh, feature replication, the two thousandths wall, as well as the surface finish, is fantastic. So we're now able to get these parts in our hands, in our customers' hands quickly. They're now putting these together. This particular program had sixteen different parts. Put them all together, see how they fit, and then go. Oh, let's go print some more. This one wasn't quite white, right. Let's print, change the design slightly. So that fast movement of of design criteria really helps us to understand again DFMEA, DFM, D DFA, and making sure that even at the printing stage that it's scalable to a molded part later because these are going to be millions and millions of parts, probably not going to be printed long term. So um, and then we measure them with our CT scan in house, which is also what I just showed you. So also some uses in micro tooling. So we're printing actually some some micro molds. And this is this is R and D, but we're printing molds to um, for medical and drug delivery components. Now even if they last two to three shots, no problem. We'll just print up another one. So that's been that's been in R and D. I think we're going to get better and better at that as things proceed here. But it's a good use for it. Um, Proving out scalable mold geometry in 3D printed parts and then flushing out design as, as quickly as we can. This is this one here is a, is a printed lens part there. And then lastly, the CT scanning. I think um, I've gone through this well enough, but to show that we can do multiple, multiple cavity stack up tolerance overlays to really look at an automated system to cavity one of this one with cavity six of this build up the, the um, assemblies and really risk mitigate at using the CT scan of the part to determine what the FEA uh, came out as. So it's really a great tool uh, all the way around. So in closing, uh, before we get to the q and I'd like to just uh, include that um, having the vertical integration here, and uh, you can see some of those case studies that micro molding, mold making, automation, CT scan, having those uh, discussions with each of those inputs really preserves the integrity of the data uh, to make sure that we're uh, carrying that through all the way from prototype to production. And then micro molding projects require rigorous management. You can see, uh, you know, microns matter, single micron looking at each stage of the process to make sure that you can still achieve um, 1.33 CPK or better on, on the capability. And then uh, continuous investment in world class equipment like SODIC. Like some of the other pieces of equipment we have and facilities, people, and systems really helps micromolders to stay ahead of miniaturization trends. It's a hot, hot topic right now and across a lot of a variety of, uh, of market segments. And so keeping the head of that um, in high precision, such as such as is required for medical and drug delivery devices. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for, for listening in and uh, we'll, we'll head over to the question section. Um, so I get again and Donna Bibber and this is Brent Hahn. He is our global director of sales and we're happy to take on your questions. We're both degreed plastics engineers and look forward to working with you. Wow, Donna, thanks so much. That, that was great. Um, did we, we saw quite a few questions come in here. So you got you got a lot of work ahead of you yet. Okay, bring them on. First, the first one here is, do you produce any micro MIM components? No, we don't. We, we've made tools for micro MIM, but we don't actually do the micro MIM. That's the sintering. That's that's one more level of complexity to, uh, to make the micro mold apart, but thankfully a little bit larger because it shrinks in the um, sintering, but the sintering is, is a whole new process part of that map that that would have to be considered, but no, we don't do that. 
the the follow up question to that, and you kind of touched, I think, a little bit on it. Do you do you provide tooling source uh, services for micro molds? We do not. We um, we all the, anything in micro is done in in house um, because it, it's really the the enabler to doing what we're doing. So we don't sell just micro molds to others. Those are used uh, captively, as is our automated assembly. Great, great. great. Um, Sure, since it is only a short time and small amount of material, right? What sheer numbers are you achieving? Brent, would you like to take that one? I, I don't know if we know that specifically. Um, it all depends on the unique situation of the resin, the gate style, uh, and what open is impacting there. But uh, we do physical testing afterwards to see if we're creating an outcome uh, with the customer that, that is negative or positive to verify that, you know, we're not degrading the material in a way that's taking away the core competencies and, and reasons why that resin was selected initially. I think one of the other things we can do there is we, we can mitigate the risk of the shear by putting it through that um, tensile bar mold. And that's a, that's a risk mitigator for us before we even start building a mold. So we'll do that before mold design review even uh, with the specific material to uh, make sure that we're we're not shearing that material with the actual size gate that it's going to go through. Great. There, there's actually a, another question that came up here to follow up to that. Um, can you speak to the shear rate maximums? Thousand one second. Um, yeah, I think that it's really material dependent because those critical um, shear values are, are on the um, specification sheet from the material supplier. So again, if it's a, if it's a shear sensitive material, we have to we have to um, build the tooling around that sensitivity and create gates that are a bit a little bit larger than what we would normally want. And so it can be done to reduce the shear um, for shear sensitive materials, but it is it is a, a slippery slope when the materials are very shear sensitive to, to make sure that you have that covered in the mold design and in the uh, design of the screw and, and residence time and all those things have to be factored into making sure that you're not influencing that in any way, shape or form throughout the whole process. I can't speak to exact, you know, what our max that we've worked with. You know, I'd, I'd have to really look at our database of library of materials that we've used to, to answer that. Great. So that's a, and that's a good point. We've created a, a library uh, using that empirical data, that small dog bone that you saw with the pin gates and edge gates. And we've built our, our, our knowledge by creating a library of those different resins using those you know, one through eight thousands, pen gates or edge gates, so we can really see and understand what's possible. So again, when someone comes to us with a new project, you know, we can of course work on that for them specifically and customize, or we may have already done it and, we, and we've created a library of that knowledge base. So uh, a lot of lessons learned and how we're retaining and keeping that information to make the next project go even faster and, and more smoothly. Great, great. Um, this from the same uh, same gentleman, I guess, that asked the other one. Have you looked at TPU, Michael Moldy? And, yes, and do you we, have we, a TPU yep. in the library? Yes, we do have TPU in the library. Several several grades of TPU. Um, uh, a lot of pacemaker components are made with TPU catheter components. Um, they have some other challenges. Those are those are also I I would put those in some of the challenging more challenging materials as like bioresorbs and TPUs um, that have some shrink values that are off the charts. So you really have to do a lot of upfront work for for those types of parts. And handling the material is tricky. Some of the grades of TPU, depending on you know what what durometer you're looking for, uh, they can be gummy. And so we have to be cognizant of how to remove the parts off of the core without uh, damaging the part. So using air when we can, or, you know, obviously filtered air. 
and, and other means to remove those types of parts from the mold itself. So those are those are definitely some of the more popular materials for, for medical drug delivery devices, specifically implants, um, but also some of the more challenging to get to, you know, very thin wall, uh, repeatable parts. We're very good at shutting off on TPU with precious metals, for example, and making sure that we have the pinch offs uh, put in correctly with that so that you don't get flash or if you do get a flash, it's in the right direction as we we do talk about flash because it's inevitable to, to any degree, a slight degree. We want to know where it's going to flash and that sometimes is a, is a conversation to have. Um, you know, when you're looking at all those notes on the drawing. Great. Here, here's a great one for you John. and and I'm not sure, you know, if you're free to say or not, but we had the question come in of what brand of machine did you buy for the two shot? There aren't very many of them out there, so um, we, we got the back felt. Okay. Yep. Um, that was, it was really, it was really customer driven as well, so. That was their, yeah. that was a follow up question, so I appreciate yeah. you, you touching on that. Um, same, same gentleman here with the high injection pressures. How do you ensure the longevity of the small core pins? Brent, would you like to take that one? Sure. Well, again, it comes back to that tool design and tool maintenance. Uh, so we're, again, a lot of ex through experience and how we address it up front and design the, the quality of the bowl that we build initially, then very, I think it was on a slide before, but, you know, very strict. Uh, make tool maintenance on how we approach that. But, um, you know, we're making sure that we're not putting undue pressure on those core pins. And that's gonna that's gonna make them you or bend. Uh, and over time that of course they will fail. So we we really spend a lot of time making sure we're addressing how the part, how the, the flow of the part and how those core pins are being affected by that flow. Uh, so we can keep the longevity. Because we're, again, we're doing many projects that are extremely high volume um that you know we can't we can't have the, the press going down or the mold going down so uh, a lot of that's work is done up front and then continually maintained great um in rough terms here how large of a capital budget would be required to develop this capability don't <laughs> join <laughs> us <laughs> how large of a budget uh, so is so is Good it answer. do you mean a whole micro molding company or you know mold or I would guess reading the question Donna they're they're looking to add that capability to their lineup you know to have oh. the, the CT scanning the the ability to make the molds it yeah so um, I'm going to take a stab at that so let's just say we we wanted one molding machine one mold average you know high high volume mold um a ct scan and all the auxiliaries is probably 3.5 million because the ct scan is not uh, a small piece of that <laughs> right and, and, and specific specifically you know really micro and high resolution ct scan so but the rest of them are you know fairly fairly um not as costly but it all adds up and you need clean room and you know so on and so on yeah if i can add to that real quickly i mean i think people choose suppliers and partners because of the people and so you could have a dollar amount for a piece of equipment uh, but these mold makers even, even the program in the ct you know it's it's a bit of an art form there, there's a tremendous amount of expertise required and required over a, a large number of years. So, you know, companies like ourselves, it's the people, you know, that truly make the company. Equipment helps enable us. Uh, but, you know, many of these solutions are created through a great deal of experience and lessons learned over time and that can go from design to the tool build all the way through. Um, so, yeah, when you look at, you know, pieces of equipment, and of course, this is being sponsored by Sodic, that's a big part of it. But the people don't underestimate the the, the variable of the, of the person and the expertise to get it all the way through the gamut uh, to be successful. 
Uh, I think that's, that's, that's a good point. I'll add to that one, one thing on that front too is, is that we do this every day. This is something that we're, we're doing micro molding and micro machining, automation, the processing all every single day, all day, and not just a piece of what we're doing is micro molding. So the knowledge base, as, as Brent said, for, for the people that have all those experiences over the last seven, seven years and 30 years in tooling um, is really, really key to our, our success moving forward. We, we 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 definitely we provide we mold parts for people that do molding themselves. I mean, I think that you know it's it's recognized by very very large companies that all of us would recognize by one name. Um, you know, they do their own molding, but they see the difference in micro molding. They see the expertise and, and equipment and and how it all comes together and is you know held all the way through the process. And so, people that do molding also turn to us. So I think that also speaks for itself. Very good, very good. Um, some of these questions, you know, if, uh, if you don't want to answer them, we can have you answer directly as well, because there's a, a lot of coming in towards this next one, right? What is the average cost of a micro? Of, of a micro mold? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a single cavity or a multiple cavity? Let's let's talk both. They they don't specify. Okay, so a single cavity, true micro component. I'm going to guess somewhere in the uh, fifteen to twenty thousand dollar range for a single cavity, and for you know high volume, can be you know three four hundred thousand dollars for a high volume uh, micro mold. So it's, it runs the gamut. Some of them can be, you know, five thousand dollars, but it's, it's on average. Um, I just gave you the average, so it's all based on complexity. Yeah. No, it's just all based on complexity. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, are there, are there special rules or specs for the material suppliers regarding variation slot to lot? You know, since the melt flow is critical for micro. Yeah, you know, we'll look at the, the range that they provide. There's been very few that we've had to go back to the material suppliers and ask for a specific range. Um, there are some some of those projects that we have had over the years that we've we needed tighter control over the melt flow rate, for example, and then require that on a cert to to make sure that we're we, we've got that covered. Um, but generally speaking, too, that we kind of break the rules for for the uh, for the material spec sheet. Um, so we might have to go higher temperatures or higher melt temps to to actually fill a product, and it's not unusual because this is a very different um, application than the the normal applications that the material suppliers have seen over the years with thirty thousand skate, forty thousand skate, fifty thousand skates. We're now, you know, sharing that material a little bit more, so that 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 needs a little bit different um, recipe, if you will, for for success. Yeah, Weston, when you think when you think about that resin, the resin company used a traditional dog bone, um, and you know, our parts many times are smaller than just the gate vestige of that dog bone that they use to create those properties. Now, of course, again, we make larger, we mold larger parts as well. It's great to show these really small ones. We make larger ones as well. Uh, but, you know, when you look at resin data sheets, it's really to, for the resin company to cover what they can manufacture, you know, so you have to think, of, you know, look at it from, where, and, I, and I've been in that industry, so I know exactly where, how those are created. It's, you know, really based on their process capabilities. And so, you know, you want to build a processing window internally that can handle those those the the, the difference uh, of materials you're going to receive in. And again, I think that builds to the strength of doing a, a great process of processing effort to understand lots of lot variability. Hey, Brent. Brent. Yeah. I bet the uh, material suppliers love you guys. <laughs> well, we, again, we have some really. You know, definitely if, if for the, we do small projects, of course, but we also do quite a few large ones. I mean, I just quoted one where 
I had a resin company go, really, you're going to buy that much? Um, and so it, it depends on the, it depends on the volume, of course, but yeah, the small <laughs> projects, you know, a bag will last a long time. Right. Um, but I, I did just make some a resin company just today ask if we were off by two zeros. And I said, no, that's actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to, sorry. Yeah. Good stuff. Very good. Thank you. Um, Next question for you here. How long would it take to create a mold for, let's say, case one, your case study number one? Uh, well, that one ended up being a multiple cavity. So um, just as a single cavity, it's, again, probably in the it's fairly simple shape, as you can see. So it's just a core pin and a, you know, a receiver and some, and some venting. So that's probably in the you know, 20,000 range, 15, 20,000 range. And, and it seems like such a simple shape. Well, it should be should be fairly inexpensive, but it's again getting that core and cavity registration to be accurate, and then getting that vent proper in the last place to fill, which is you know less than three thousandths of an inch. So it's really registering that appropriately, and then getting the gate sizes accurately. So somewhere around twenty for for a single cavity, and and much and just extrapolate that from eight or sixteen. Um, but you can get some economies of scale, obviously, with the, with the higher higher uh, cavitation. And, and Donna, on that one, how long did it take us to build the mold? Uh, so a single cavity, somewhere around six weeks, somewhere in there, six, six seven weeks. Yeah. Great. Great. So as a, as a micro molding facility, there's many, uh, many challenges, right? What are some of the common ones between a traditional tooling facility and a, and a micro molding facility? Uh, in terms of the mold, I would have to say, you know, making sure you get the design right up front uh, is, is definitely, you know, that, that mitigates a lot of risk and, and the years of experience mitigates a lot of risk. Challenges, I would have to say, are measurement of some of those because you know when you get a lot of inserts for example and everything's inserted um measuring what we have in steel uh and so if we've done some little tricks to the trade here to, to measuring uh molds themselves by uh using that uh no shrink metrology rubber and then ct scanning it basically so we are ct scanning what we get in a mold um as a rubber piece um, and, and kind of extrapolating because it's, it's no shrink rubber. So it should replicate exactly what we have there. But I guess that's maybe one of the things is to try to uh, measure what we have in steel to make sure that we have that 20% of, uh, of tolerance covered uh, in an actual mold versus theoretically what we, what we ask for. I, I also just add mindset. You know, again, you wanna, you know, it's, this is a different way of approaching projects. You know, you're really, you know, every variable has to be viewed from the lens to get down to this level of accuracy. And so, you know, I would just say also mindset and culture, because it's very important that we you live that to be able to handle projects like this. Yep, and, and one other that I can think of too is uh, surface finish. Uh, and depending on what material that we're ejecting or in, injecting, the surface finish of the mold can make a big difference. And so um, we have we have learned some, again, some ways to, uh, with certain materials, to have the release characteristics um, put into the mold with respect to surface, a specific surface finish that's going to help us to get those parts out. And so I think that's also, again, a mindset as well, because you never would think about surface finish being that important to a molded part. But we have to look at every single piece of the puzzle and what that surface finish is and how it's going to interact with the rest of the uh, assembly of the mold to make sure that we're using that surface finish to our advantage in, in the end. Excellent. Um, what, what would you say is the uh, total or typical number of shots for a micro mold? Your typical tool like we still build to the uh, SPI uh, class 101 standard, so that's a million shots 
Now, these core pins can be, you know, hair size, but we still need to make them last for full depreciation value of the tool. Um, and how we how we do that is we create spares for those those components that are uh, have a high likelihood. Again, at the PFMEA, they would have a high likelihood of breaking at some point. We would validate the spares along with the other components of the mold, so that we, in the event that we did break one, this spare is already validated and can, is ready to go as well. So um, there's there's ways of, of getting around that, but um, it's inevitable when you have you know, core pins that are two, three thousandths in diameter, there there will be some some breakage. It's just mitigating that risk. Sure. Do you see warpage issues in micro molding? And and if so, how do you compensate for it? Brent, would you like to take that one? So Wes, did you say warpage? I couldn't quite hear you there. Yeah. Uh, do you see warpage issues in micro molding? And, and how do you compensate it? Uh, not as much. I mean, there's typically you're finding warpage in larger parts. Uh, that doesn't mean that it can't exist, but um, you know, I think it's it comes down to again to you're setting up the tool design and and the the mold itself in such a, a such a way that it's that we we're not experiencing that problem nearly as often as I would say in traditional molding in larger parts. Excellent. Here's a question in reference to your CT scanning and, and this individual, not sure if they missed it or, or what they didn't hear it covered, but what were the part size restrictions for CT scanning? And when is CT scanning used for capability studies and process inspection? Yes, both, uh, both for validation and in process. Um, we, we run our CT scan over two shifts. We still have a third shift for capacity. Um, but the smallest um, that you saw, the smallest one we've done, which is uh, 1,000 parts per plastic pellet, that was CT scanned, uh, 0. 0.00004 grams. And the largest, um, we've actually done one that's uh, an assembly now because there's multiple parts there, and it does distinguish the difference between density of each of the components in the assembly. And so the largest, I'm going to guess, was somewhere around two and a half inches. But because our window in our high resolution is smaller than that, we have to stitch that two and a half inches together. I think there were three passes at it and then stitch the three together. So typically we're in, you know, an inch and a half and below, but we can do larger parts. If we're, we're doing several parts in that assembly. And then as, um, as, as a, a, a partnership with our, our customer, they have this, we've done all these parts and then they have a few others that are larger we would CT scan the whole assembly for them um, and show them where those stack up tolerances are in the full assembly, which is which is a value. But um, that's probably the largest we've done is maybe like two and a half down to the speck of dust. Wow, incredible. Um, any experience with hot runners for micro mold? And, and what are the yes. challenges there? Yep, um, so we, we run a Husky hot runner. Um, it's really hot to cold, so it's a, a valve gate to a cold runner. And um, that was the part that I showed with the 8,000th wall. That, that was actually a Husky hot runner. Um, the, ch the challenge with the, the hot runners is you have to really find the right application for it because we're, we're really talking about residence time. And so we, we want to be careful to really go through that screw and determine what our residence time is and then put it through some more heat. We don't want to um, you know, extend that heat profile on, on the molded parts if we don't have to. So it's, it's rare that we would find an application that would, would be truly micro and go into a hot runner system. Um, but we have been successful with the thin wall part as I showed you before, it's a half inch long. Um, and been successful with the hot to cold. Um, many there are there are micro um, hot runners available. I think you mentioned one, Len, at the beginning, and there there are a few of them out there that it seems like each time we say, "What do you think of this?" and they're like, "Ah, it's too small." Um, so it's, it's dipping the toe in the water is the is the challenge for uh, taking that risk on, um, and and it just doesn't seem like there's a ton of them that 
that are really good fits for for that extended uh, residence time. Do you guys use uh, direct valve gates and, and overflows? We do both. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. How how successful have you been getting multiple lots for validation? We rarely get three. Uh, I think maybe in my career I've seen three, uh, maybe two or three times. Um, two is pretty common. Uh, one, of course, is easy, but two is pretty common. Great. Uh, do you see any difference in the success rate for micro molded parts between hot molding and cold molding? Brent, would you like to take that one? Well, yeah, if, if, I, if I'm, I think I understand the question correctly. I think we just kind of went through from the hot side of it. So, you know, definitely much more of it's on the cold side. Um, so I would, you know, hot, much, we're definitely doing a majority of our projects with cold. Uh, some questions on pellet sizes in, in micro molding. Are the standard pellet sizes an issue, or do you need to have smaller pellet size? Right. Yeah, so of course, if it's large, uh, the large pellets, you know, can cause problems with the screw, uh, but that's that's more of a manufacturing defect versus uh, that. Uh, do we require small pellets? Not necessarily. We've been we've been successful with our our sodic and uh, our ability to go with standard size pellets for micro molding. So we're not requiring um, them to be downsized or asking for special pellet sizes. We can go with industrial standards. Great. Hey, Len, if you're still on, uh, here's a direct question for Sodic if you want to jump on the answer. Yeah, yeah sure, Wes. Uh, any sodic modifications to run the FEP material, such as special materials? Or... Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, sodic machines are, are built, you know, for your high temp engineering grade uh, materials, and such, uh, you know, like CPM 9V, 10V equivalent screws and barrels are standard. All 800 degree heaters are standard on our machines. But with, uh, you know, the, the Teflons and stuff like that, um, we, you know, difficult stuff, very corrosive material. So we um, we offer a uh, FE package uh, on the, for the injection unit, any material contact point, would, um, which we're very familiar with, but you could be up in the, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 you know, upgrade range for, for your injection unit for, for that stuff. But yeah, we do it. Yep. Same with the mold, it, 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 it is corrosive and they're, they're you will replace those molds much more frequently than uh, up to a million shots. So that's that's really where where the kind of the rubber hits the road with um, the the SPI class 101 is you will replace uh, FEP tools more frequently, and so that has to be understood as how how are how the gates are wearing during validation, so that we can kind of extrapolate that and really nail down the costs. It's, it's just not known right at time of quote sometimes. We can we can guesstimate that, but it's really um, understood during validation. Great. Great. Um, here's a question kind of towards your soda presses, Donna. Is what, what's your typical screw diameter? And, and with that, do you still shoot 20 to 80% of your capacity or, or shot? Yeah, so um, our, our typical screw size is the 14, nothing less than that. I mean, we can go to the 12, um, just kind of limits us um, with torque requirements for high heat materials. And, you know, we, we can do easily the polyolefins. It just doesn't give us a lot of flexibility if we are have a, a molding press that we're building for other, you know, using for two different um, applications. Um, so a 14 millimeter screw and above is really kind of where our sweet spot is. And, uh, and yes, we still use, you know, 80% uh, of the shot capacity, um, generally speaking, and less. 
Excellent. There was one, there was one, and you might remember this, Len, um, that we used 100% uh, of the capacity of the screw because it was compressing uh, in in the in the uh, hot runner, which right. is why there's, there's not a lot of um, hot runner um, materials that will that will go real well because they just because of where shooting them at so fast speed and through small gates, it's just we get this massive compression. It's like where the where the shot go? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean that's. That that could be easily overlooked. You might have 100 yeah. shots at that hot runner, like you said before, under heat, but yeah. the compressibility of it, it's yeah. not a one-to-one -one ratio. You might you might inject the amount you need, although it gets buried in that hot runner. That's right. You know. That's right. Oh, real, really hey, like cool one. While I have you on there, Len, uh, does Zodic build micro-molding machines suitable for MIM? For MIM. We, we we do some MIM, but there is some uh, like stainless and iron copper, things like that have done in the past. It's certainly not a focus of ours, uh, you know, maybe in the future more, but but not not as of right now. For, for Great, thank you. Um, leads us to another material question here, and I'm not sure if this is directed for, for Sodic machines in general or or for your business, Donna? So I'll, I'll answer a little bit here for Sodic and turn it over to you. Um, it talks about processing peak material and, and if you do. Um, and I guess from the Sodic side, I'd say Len had just spoke to that in, in length, I guess, with the, the way that we're constructed with the high heater um, bands standard and, and the temperature or the materials on your screws and barrels so but do you guys at isometric mold peak material oh yes we we mold a lot of peak material um the the challenge i guess with peak is it likes bigger gates and so we have to be creative again with with gate sizes on smaller parts and um possibly having secondary ops to remove those because it does like a bigger gate uh, we've gotten wall thickness, however, on our on our tensile bar tool and other parts uh, in the six five thousandths range, and fairly long in peak. So we've we've had some very good success, but it's it's challenging for for gate size, generally speaking. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, from from your side, how has the product shipped? You know, I I know you said in there that breathing on a part can change the size. Our shipping product control. There's a variety of packaging options. Um, sometimes they're just in a you know a, a bulk bag if we just want a component. Um, other times in a tray. When we're bringing an automated system, we're bringing other larger components to the micro component. Um, those will be put together as an assembly in a tray or in a some type of a, a thermal form pack. Um, but uh, those are probably the two most common or will will uh, mold our own tray in some cases and it's custom uh, molded part um, for to, to fit uh, maybe a needle, for example. Um, and so uh, there's not a lot of options for micro packaging. And so we have to be creative on that front um, if it's not if it's not fitting in a, into a thermal foam tray with a with a lid or a tie back. Also use um, glass vials uh, with caps or plastic vials with caps in, in some cases, and, in, and those will get shipped uh, in a double bag with double label. Great, great. Here's a uh, last question to actually come in here is, how do you take these micro parts from the core and mold without damage? Can it be automated using antiform tooling? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you do it very carefully, uh, but yes, we use uh, it, it, end of arm tools uh, are are very much a part of how we work with our with our molds and our parts, uh, and it, it gives you know that repeatability um, as well as we know that we're 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 handling it correctly. We're not going to damage it. We're keeping orientation if we're going to go into a tray. Uh, so end of arm tools the core is the the key to that, and just and the end of arm tool. You know, traditionally think of some grippers or a few, you know, suction cups. We we take it, you know, we've taken we take it much much further into how we 
grab the part and uh, how we control it with static and everything else. And uh, so our environment tools are are part of you know way this has learned over years to create additional reduce variables and create different solutions. Excellent. Well, great. Um, I think we're we're over over the time here by a little bit, but I just some good good conversations to be had there. Um, I want to say on behalf of myself and Len Hampton, Bennett Howard, and the team at Soda Plus Tech, I want to say thanks, Donna and, and Brent, for uh, presenting today. And for everyone that joined us, thank you for, for jumping on here and listening to a, a great presentation on Michael Molding. Yeah, thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity and uh, all the great questions. Uh, so thank you, Sodic, uh, for, for this opportunity. Appreciate it. Oh, anytime, anytime, Donna. It was fantastic. Uh, Brent as well. Fantastic uh, content. Uh, I think it was enjoyed uh, by everybody. And uh, Isometrics is a fantastic source. Um, I know there's a lot more interest now, a lot of interest all the time when it comes to, to um, micro molding these days. And, and it, everything's getting smaller and more precise, right? So that's good for us. <laughs> but uh, yes. But yes, thanks so much and, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. You too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.